hope that they find a fresh perspective on Native culture and find that there is a diverse amount. There is an incredible, you know, diversity of tribes in Oklahoma for people who don't understand that. And I hope that they can satisfy their quest for whatever historic information that they want, um, but also to understand that we have a um, revitalized culture and are very contemporary people. This is our model of our site, and you can see it's, um, it's built, it's laid out like a cosmological clock. And that is it, totally intentional. It's also laid out on the cardinal directions. And that has to do with the geniuses and the community people uh, who came together and laid it out with the actual architects. So um, the larger circle, the, you can see that there's two circles here and then they intersect. So the larger circle is representative of our ancestors. 30 of the 39 tribes in Oklahoma have mound building roots. And so that is our big mound, that earthwork is a nod to our ancestors that were here in this state and others um, across the Southeast. And then this circle has to do with the now and the future. So it's our contemporary none. And then where they intersect, this is the hall of the people right there. And this is, I think it's like 100 feet on the outside, 90 on the inside, it's lit. And this is a remnant, it's supposed to look like, I mean, it does look like the grass houses of the indigenous tribes of Oklahoma, which is the Caddo and the Wichita. And I think there's a picture of one, you've probably seen them. But that's what it's intended to look like is a grass house. <clears throat> and then the way the mound, the way it works is um, on the shortest day of the year, the winter solstice, when the sun sets, if you're standing at the center of the festival grounds, the sunset comes down and it fills this tunnel with light. It completely fills it and it's just like glowing. It's beautiful. And then the sun travels back over here to the peak of the mound by the summer solstice. And it sets right at the tip of the mound on June 21st every year. <laughs> and we've watched closely every year to make sure <laughs> we're not off at all. And then that's it travels back down this way until it's the winter solstice, fills that with light. And so we've had several, even though we haven't been open, we always recognize it. I like the idea to help people understand that we still exist uh, and that uh, we are here, we've been here, and we have a great culture, history, stories to share. And it's nice to finally tell the story from our point of view. We wanted to start the entire, entire experience of the Tribal Nations Gallery off with the Origins Theater because much like a Genesis story, the, our origin stories, every tribe has their own and it ex gives you all the kind of instructions you need for life in those origin stories, how to treat each other, what you're here for, how to live, it, it answers all those questions. And they're laid out and generally they can take days and days to relate. Um, what we wanted to do was just convey right away that all these values that we are, you know, trying to highlight in here that tie all these tribes together. We have shared values that um, tie us together, but it's our origins that are simultaneously, you know, the source of our diversity. And so we're all very different. We have our own cultures, we're our own languages, but we all have these origin stories that repeat themselves and so we, we started to find a way to you know that's how we can tell this story is the shared traditional native values so this is our origins theater we worked with batwin and robin for this also and we go through four origin stories in here and um this is the pawnee story people who came down from the stars the next is yuchi and it's starts in water and earth diver story. The next is Caddo, people who emerged from the earth. And then the fourth is Oto in Missouri. And that has to do with, in their origin stories, it teaches them their clan system and how, their structure and how you're gonna live and how to treat each other. And so it's 320 degrees around. I think it's a 10 feet, a 10 foot, you know, bottom to top screen. And then we light up 
constellations that are meaningful to each of these tribes during their story at a, at a particular time. And so this is to kind of also, you know, what we wanted to do here was sort of <clears throat> a paradigm shift. Everybody's going to come here with what they think they already know about Native culture, what they've seen in the media, or, you know, their own understanding of it um, that's been shaped from the time that they were little. And we really wanted to meet them right at the beginning and kind of make a paradigm shift like this. That's what you know. And let us, you know, show you a little bit about us from our perspective. I think that it would be incredibly meaningful for a visitor to take away an understanding that all of these tribes are different, these cultures are still alive, that they're still living cultures, and more importantly that everybody, there's still something to learn from all of these teachings for everybody, including Native people, but also the larger community and that they're welcome. I do want them to feel welcomed back. There's a lot of controversy around teaching this type of history and these types of perspectives. And I don't want people to feel fearful about that or afraid because these perspectives, what we're adding to this conversation can only enrich this state and it's good for everybody. This state has a deep, deep history in culture and diversity and there's a lot to learn from that there's a lot to take away from that and a lot to feel proud about and i want community to feel welcome to come here upstairs our, our smithsonian exhibit is called winnico life of an object and that is object rich so these objects were collected out of oklahoma between 1809 to 1811 by a gentleman named Harrington for George Gustav High. And that exhibit, those, that collection ended up being the NMAI's collection that they have. And so we are bringing those objects home from every tribe, a sample from every tribe. And it's the first time these objects have been home in over a hundred years, so. And then this is Cultural Continuum. And in here um, is a continuation of some of these tribal objects that we brought home. But what it's about is cultural continuum, that this is still a living culture. Our cultures are very much still alive. We still create these things. We still use these things. We still know their purpose. And, and again, it, it's diverse. I mean, there's, you know, these things come from cultures that represent the entire North American continent rather than just Oklahoma. And their different ways of doing things are really beautiful. We do relate part of our history that is not easy to digest. I mean, it's, these are tough stories, but this is the first time we get to share our own experiences and perspectives, our triumphs and tragedies, and we're overjoyed, you know, to be able to do that for the first time, to have a voice, and to also hear other people's perspectives and, you know, how we would love to kind of start a dialogue and have that conversation with the larger community and grow from it and become partners, you know, with other communities and just, I really want people from across the state to come here and gain knowledge and also share their perspectives on, you know, what's happening and how we can all work together. Grandfather started making wine back in the 30s, so kind of always kind of been around a little bit of it as a childhood. And then a uh, chance come open to buy this property. Uh, it was actually uh, owned by Miss Printner. It's been a flyer shop since day one for over 50 years. And then when I purchased it, I decided to turn it into a winery since I own another winery. I wanted one in Yukon. And then we decided to turn it into a pizzeria too. We do sweets and dries, uh, rosés, uh, reds and whites. The dries are for your moderate to entry level drinker and then the sweets are more entry level to moderate to light sweet not heavy sweet. My personal favorite is the Rembrandt and it is a Sangiovese red. It is a, a dark red dry wine. Notes of cherry uh, finishes a little bit of oak um, 
but real easy drinking for a red, for a deep red. That's probably my favorite. Best seller is a Midnight Marvel, and that is a blackberry wine. Once again, really easy drinking, light sweet. Where the other one was dry, this one's a lighter sweet uh, red wine. It's a New York style crust. We do offer a cauliflower crust for people that want a, a gluten-free. But the New York style crust that we, um, we make our own dough in-house, we make our own sauce in-house. And we have some classics like a Supreme. Uh, the Supreme we named Imperial, and that's a flower as well. So our pizzas are named after flowers as well. Probably my favorite is one we have a Paradise, which you think of Hawaii. So our Hawaiian pizza is Paradise. We top it with a hot honey, so it's a little twist, a little different. But we have, of course, your pepperoni, your, you know, all meat, etc. But we have some unique ones too, like a, a margarita where we put pesto on it instead of basil. Vegetarian, one of them, we have three or four options for vegetarians. One of the most popular is called Stargazer. Starts with a white Alfredo sauce and then has artichokes, onions, garlic, mushrooms, red onions. It's really good for outdoors is really one of a kind. We're downtown Yukon, but we actually have a patio that is nestled in trees and in between an old house and then the, the pizzeria. So it's really a beautiful spot. You can catch some live music on the weekends. It's just a perfect date night. Sum it up, we are a winery and pizzeria where we make all of our wine in house. We craft our pizzas fresh every day. We have a beautiful patio. Uh, we have live music on the weekends. It's family friendly, Fido friendly, uh, just a perfect place. We have an interesting take on the food. First of all, it is originally Pakistani food. It's uh, authentic and uh, we wanted to make sure that we were able to give the, the food of the street vendors. Because we ourselves were a food truck, so it, it resonated with us to sell the food of the street vendors of Pakistan. My menu was all the stuff that you can eat, go walk down the street in Pakistan and find you know, from any vendor or anybody on the street side. So that was the whole concept of selling kebabs and uh, stir-fried curries and tandoori uh, chicken and things that, you know, that are like uniquely uh, Pakistani and uh, the flavors were authentic and um, that's the whole concept behind uh, Sizzle and Spice is to sell street vendor food in this restaurant. Our personal favorite and our best seller is the uh, Royal Tandoori Platter which has the tandoori chicken tikka pieces. It has the uh, chapli kebab, which is uh, authentically regional uh, kebab that's only available in our region of Pakistan, where we are from. And then there's the Sikh kebab, which is traditionally in every Indian or Pakistani restaurant, you'll find it. But our take on it is very regional. So it's something very different. And uh, it comes with a flavorful basmati pilaf rice, uh, side salad and chutney, so it's a complete meal in itself. So everybody goes for that. It's a very good uh, platter and introduction to try different kebabs at the same time. And then our uh, the karais that we have. Karais are the stir fry style wok dishes that are made on high heat on the wok, and it's it's a delicious, delicious way to try some of the best Pakistani curries. Is karais. So this process is called bhuna in Pakistani cuisine. Bhuna means to stir fry something at high heat. So that's a, a technique that's only done in the, in the subcontinent and it's called bhuna. So any dish that you hear of like beef bhuna or uh, chicken bhuna means something that's dry, curried and spiced and uh, it is cooked at a very high heat and uh, cooked over, over a long period of time. So this dish right here, it's served in the uh, street food of Pakistan, so it's, it's a beloved dish. The chicken karai is number one, then the second comes the sea kebab karai. In these dishes, you can go to any daba food stride, uh, stall and get these uh, any time of the day. For the vegetarian options, we have the paneer cheese karai. So 
So th- th- that item in itself is traditionally Pakistani. And then other than that, we have our curries. So I would, uh, my favorite is the butter chicken curry. And this is the famous butter chicken that we have or the chicken tikka masala. Basically they're similar, so I just call that, you know, butter chicken tikka masala. And then this is the Nihari slow roasted beef. This one gets the royal treatment with a dollop of curry in there. A nice generous dollop of curry, I mean cream. And the cream helps it to, you know, tap down the spices and just give it a nice creamy buttery flavor. So everybody enjoys uh, the butter chicken mostly because of the milder flavor. But if, if for a starter curry, this is the best curry to try for a starter curry. I mean, this would be something that I'm, I'm sure you'd get addicted to uh, after some time. My favorite is the chapel kebab. I would like whenever, wherever I would go visit my friends, whether it's Virginia or whether it's Syracuse or wherever I would go, one thing that I would make for them and everybody would be like, oh my God, I mean, how do you do that? Is, is the chapal kebab. So this dish is indigenous to the Pashtun people of Pakistan. It's originated from the Pashtun area, which is uh, called the KPK province, uh, where we are from. And so this is specifically a very regional dish that you can get only at Sizzle and Spice. You won't be able to get it in any other restaurant except Sizzle and Spice Kebab Grill. Our hearts and souls have gone into making this so authentic and so Oklahoman in itself that could be Pakistani but have an Oklahoman touch yes. to it, you know? It, it should have like something which everybody can identify with. So that's something that I would love people to know about it, is that, you know, this is like a true mesh of both, both types yeah. of cuisines. We so. wanted to keep, and then plus Alize, our daughter, is a big part in uh, how and how spice levels work for us. Because whenever me and Tanya would make something, she's kind of our tester, it was like, oh, she's enjoying it. That means every seven, eight year old kid we'll born it. and raised in Oklahoma can enjoy this food. Yeah. All right, great. You know, so. so she was our official She was our official standard. Yeah, <laughs> standard. So like, uh, so we kind of like kept all our cuisine to where it's authentic. Yes, it's not super crazy on the spice level, even though our name is Sizzle and Spice. So, you know, but we want everybody to enjoy the food. So we yes. kept it to where everybody can enjoy this Enjoy food. it, yes. I would say one of the pleasures that we get from opening this restaurant is to serve people. And uh, that's the thing we want to do. We always wanted, this was his dream yeah. and my dream, to that's... serve people and talk with them and just have a one-to-one -one relationship where they know our name and we know their name and they're our friends and they come and chill out here. Yeah, totally, totally. Once you're here, you're family and you're definitely a friend. So, you know, yeah. it's like way above the customer level. So, and we would just want to share everything that we have with our friends and family and, uh, yeah. Thank you.